the interesting attributes of using card for estimation is that the set of numbers that we're going to pick is necessarily limited. And for planning poker, the standard sequence is the numbers we have listed above. 0, 1, half, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. The initial integers in the sequence come from the Fibonacci sequence, where each number is a sum of the two previous numbers. Of course, the 1 half doesn't fit. And when we get up to 13, the next one ought to be 21, but it's actually 20. And after that, clearly we're not following the Fibonacci sequence. There is no particular rationale that I know behind the numbers that ended up being chosen for this, once we get above 13. Fortunately, it turns out not to be terribly critical what those numbers are, because as a rule, once we get up that high, we are estimating something that's too big, it should be broken down to smaller pieces anyway. So we don't take those numbers too seriously, except as a guide to say, this is too big, chop it up, and come back and ask us again. Infinity and the question mark have their own meanings. The question mark means I don't know. You're asking a question I have no expertise on, so I'm willing my question to indicate that I can't estimate anything. If everyone around the table does that, then we have a serious problem. Infinity means this thing is so big, there's really no point in estimating it. We're probably not going to get infinities very often. Probably not more than once. After that, the person who wrote the requirements knows not to do something that big again. The other interesting thing about this sequence, or any sequence that we're likely to use in a real planning poker process, is the spacing between the numbers increases. Now, the reason for that is the uncertainty that we have for any thing that we're estimating might be 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%, whatever, or a factor of two. As the thing gets bigger, the relative uncertainty might stay the same, but the absolute uncertainty grows because the thing is growing as well. This means that while the difference between an estimate of 1 and 2 is very significant, the difference between 10 and 11 is not very significant. Because if we know something within a factor of 2, then we estimate it at 1, it might be a half, it might be 2, but it's not going to be 10. There are not many numbers that will fall within the range. But if the answer is, say, 13, and it's within a factor of 2, there's not much point in debating whether it's 13 or 14. We could, and people will, get into long debates about things like that if you let them. But the reality is, none of the answers we're going to come up with are all that precise to begin with. And debating whether it's a 13 or a 14 will waste a lot of time and be very productive. The reality is we don't really care which it is, and we aren't going to know, and our estimates are not going to be good enough to distinguish between those cases anyway. So we have the spacing increase as the numbers go up to avoid unproductive debates about whether it's really a 12, or 13, or a 14. Now, so far, I've spoken of estimation and estimates as though they existed independent of any particular system of units. But in fact, everything that we estimate quantitatively has units of some kind. Material goods will have units of weight in pounds or kilograms, volumes in liters or gallons, lengths in miles or kilometers, and so forth. Tasks in a project will typically have effort based units, for example, person hours or man hours or person days, things that we can map to duration based on whether there are weekends and holidays involved, how many people are working on it, and so forth. Those are fairly obvious units. When it comes to estimating requirements, which is what we do all the time in agile projects, we have things called stories, there are no unique units because there are more than one way to estimate them. So we could, for example, estimate a requirement such as create an application screen of particular functionality in terms of the effort required. So we can estimate that in person days because we think it's going to take 15 or 13 person days to implement that functionality. We could also choose complexity as a measure of the size of the requirement. For example, function points, which are not so popular now as they used to be, but which reflect complexity, the number of types of things that the screen is going to be doing. Another unit that is popular for many Agile projects is called story points, which is also a measure of complexity, but rather than being tied to uh, very specific details, the way function points are, it's more of a gut level estimate. So we'll find all these and others used in estimating requirements as a state from tasks. It's not terribly important for particular projects so much what, what unit they use. What really is important is that whatever units they use works for the people who are doing the estimation and implementation. 
Now let's talk about what happens in an estimation session as we, as we move towards actually doing this. So within an estimation session, using a planning and poker style process, there are three roles. There's a role of the facilitator, first you play right in the session. And what the facilitator does is runs the meeting, enforces the schedule, keeps people moving, focused, keeps the discussions productive, short, focused on the subject matter. Cuts off interesting sidelines about the latest football game or, or how the subject at hand would be better with more beer or anything like that. And it's good to have fun and uh, chat keep things lively but at the same time. We don't want to have those things consume our estimation session, keep us tied up in the stuffy room longer than we need. Second role is the requirements owner. In Scrum we call it that the product owner. Other methodologies or processes have other names for this person, like business analyst. But he's a person who wrote the requirements. Very simple. He's a person who will answer questions about the requirements. He has to be here in the session because we will be asking him questions to clarify what's going on, what is the wants. Third role are the people doing the estimation, the team members or the estimators. And their job is simply, of course, to provide estimates. As a part of getting to estimates, they will also be discussing the thing they're being asked to estimate with each other and with the requirements owner, and asking questions of the requirements owner to clarify what it is that he or she wants. Before an estimation meeting can be kicked off, there's certain prerequisites. Things have to be done in advance. Obvious things such as setting the time and duration of the meeting. It's going to be Tuesday from 1 to 3 p.m. The people who are going to be doing the estimation need to know what it is they're going to be estimating. We don't want to get them all in a room and then for the very first time throw them a stack of things that we want to get their, their numbers on. So in advance of the meeting, we want to have all the items that are going to be estimated identified and, and publicized so that the estimators can look them over in advance. Read them, think about them, internalize what's going on, talk to each other or anyone else, come to an understanding, a better understanding of what they're going to be thinking about and estimating. So we need to allocate time to do that in advance. And as they prepare for the meeting, they should generate a list of questions or open issues they want to bring to the estimation session that they can ask should not already been answered. So these types of preparation are critical. If team members do not have the chance to look at the items in advance and think through them, what would take an hour in an estimation meeting can blow out into four hours very easily and become a more painful experience for everyone. So preparation is essential. The actual conduct of an estimation meeting with planning poker is very simple. Facilitator will read each item that's going to be estimated Moderate brief discussion. Team members will talk to each other and to the requirements are to clarify what it is that's being wanted and any open issues they have. And then call for estimates. Each estimator will then pick a card, hide it so no one else can see what's on it, and when the facilitator calls for vote, show it so everyone can see at the same time what everyone else is voting. That's how we avoid the expert bias. We get to see anyone else's answers in advance. Sometimes the results of this are that everyone comes up with the same result, the same part. And if that's the case, then we're done. That does happen sometimes. I'm always surprised when it does, but it does happen occasionally. More commonly, as we discussed before, there'll be a range of values. And the facilitator will ask high and low people to explain.